Well, good morning, Frontline. How's everybody doing this morning? Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Uh, excited that you're joining us. If you're in the lobby, it is snowing outside, by the way. Um, and that's really fun. Um, but uh, if you are in the lobby and you want to make your way in here, we'd love to have you join us as we worship. Um, would you go ahead and stand as we just lift up our King this morning?
So as we come out of Thanksgiving, many of us are, are thankful and grateful for many things. And as we head into this Christmas season, we're especially grateful for one person. Matthew 1 says, The virgin be, will be with child, and he will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so the gospel, it offers this hope that whatever void we have, whatever gap exists, whatever discrepancy there is with us and God, Jesus taking on the humble um, condition of man and being fully God and fully man, that changes things for us. That transforms who we are. God taking on a humble condition of a man means the world for us. And so as we look towards his birth, we're grateful that there's no longer any confusion. God becoming man means that we know how to worship him and how to follow him. And so as a church, we get to celebrate that in this season. As a church, we get to have that hope that the world doesn't have. And so let's offer it through how we live. And so Father, we just, we sit in your presence this morning and God, we acknowledge who you are and you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. God, everything we are, everything we have is because of you. God, we're thankful for many things, but we're really thankful for who you are. And God, you did a lot for us, but we're more thankful for your being who you are. You are the son of God, Jesus. And so our hearts celebrate this season where we get to sit in the gap and just watch you. Watch you work in our community. Watch you work in our lives, God. And so um, if there's somebody in the room that doesn't know you, God, would they start to wonder what it's like to spend time with you? What it's like to just draw near? What it's like to just open up your word and seek after you? acknowledge right now what's reality and that you're the king you're on the throne lord and god you care for us god you didn't need us you don't need us still and yet you died for us and it started because god you emptied yourself of power through, through your son and because of that lord we stand here in awe of you today so as your church, God, we lift up your name and all God's people said, amen. Well, good morning, church. You may be seated. So right off the top, God's just been doing a lot here at Frontline. And um, man, I've just been so grateful to be a part of that, even a small part of that. And this past Sunday, man, we had 15 people get baptized. And so, yeah, come on. God's, God gets the glory for that. Many of those people, uh, you know, they showed up, and man, we had people getting baptized in sweatshirts. They did not plan to get baptized, and yet they took that step of faith, and so um, as a church, we get to celebrate that. Um, and so, man, it's so good to worship here. I'm so glad you guys are here. If we haven't met yet, my name is Cody. I'm the Connections Pastor here. Um, and so if you're with us for the first time, whether you're here in person or online, we just want to say welcome. Glad you're with us. And um, one of the best ways that we kind of help new people get connected is through our newcomers lunch. Um, and so we have it about once a month. And so it's um, starting next week after second service, we're gonna have another one. And um, I just want everyone to know, like that's an open invite. I know it's newcomers lunch, um, but even if you've been here a while, that invite is for you as well. And so if you're wondering, how do I know if, if that's the right space for me to be in? If you attend regularly or if you engage here on Sunday morning, but you've never connected outside of that, we would say that would be a great space for you to come. Just connect with people, um, learn a little bit of how to just connect and engage a little bit deeper. So we want to invite you to that. So again, that's next week. Um, and to sign up for that, if you go to frontlinegr.com slash new, or I'll be out here in the lobby and I can help you sign up as well. Um, and so we hope to see you there for that. 
Um, and so many of you, maybe, maybe that's not the right next step for you. Uh, maybe you are, you know, engaged with our church, you're connected, you're serving. Um, and so we just want to let you know that we have um, the essential store kind of um, out in the lobby. We have a representative there. And so last week I talked a little bit about um, the essentials Christmas party. And so that party is exclusively for the members of the essential store, and we get to sponsor families, and we get to use that time to actually give those gifts that we as a church um, actually, you know, uh, buy and, and give to these people. So if you want to connect with that, that's a great way to just um, engage with our church and, and make an impact in our community. So right out in the lobby to the right, you can either sign up to serve to help for that party. I think they need about 20, 30 people. So there's a pretty significant need there. So if you want to jump in um, for a temporary serving thing for, for December, we would invite you to that. Um, and you can also sponsor a family there as well. So hope you engage there with us. Um, and so regardless if you're a part of that or not, we all have a part um, to, you know, and, and that's to engage in prayer. Um, and so we, we hope, man, there's a lot of need in our community and there's, you know, organizations that are just flooded with, with people who are homeless or have certain needs. So if you would just partner with us and, and pray for our community and, uh, and we'll invite you right into the room. So the last couple Tuesdays, we gathered corporately in prayer together as a church. And man, for those of you who have, who have came to that, God's really showed up. Um, that's just been really refreshing to my soul personally. And so we wanna invite you into that space. Um, we're gonna spend some time this Tuesday just in adoration of who God is and, and just his being. And so that's six to 7 a.m. and six to 7 p.m. this Tuesday. So we hope to see you there. And you'll see too, there's some cards on your seats and also in the back of the room by the exits, um, there's a basket where you can put those prayer request cards in. So even if you can't be there with us, man, put a, put a prayer request on there. We'd love to lift that up as a church for you. Um, and so that's a way you can engage in that as well. So as we continue in worship, one of the things um, that God just invites us into every week is, is just our tithes and offerings. And um, scripture, uh, it just speaks of, of it everywhere, of our sacrifice of giving. Um, God actually receives that as worship, and um, it's actually a holy act in his eyes. And so maybe you're here and you give every week, um, and maybe you're here and you've never given. And so we just want to encourage you, take that step of faith and, and try to give this morning. Um, and it's not about the amount, it's the posture of our heart to say, hey, God, I'll trust you with this. Um, and so we get to do that corporately as a body. So if you would, please join me as I pray over the offering the message this morning. So Father, we just thank you just for the season that we're in, God. Many, many churches and businesses were, were financially hurting in this COVID season, and we, and we lift them up to you, and God, somehow, some way, you've, you've allowed us to thrive through that, God, and, and I can only point that to you. So God, we thank you that you continue to, to multiply and bless what we give to you, and, and Lord, I just pray that for us in the room that, um, yeah, just, just turn our hearts to you as we give and we worship in that way. And so God, I just want to pray for David that as he preaches this morning, that as he just gives us an important reminder of what it's like to be um, rather than just do all the time, God, would you help us to just sit with that and allow your spirit to, to move us to, to whatever that looks like in this season. So we pray this in your name. Amen. We aren't very good at running our own lives. We fail. We say the wrong thing. We burn out. As you study the patterns of Jesus in the gospel stories, you quickly find that Jesus had a different approach to living. His life was marked by dependence, surrender, and prayer. In 2021, God is calling our church back to that life. Prayer can no longer be seen as a luxury item in our self-made spirituality. Prayer is more than a private activity separated from our communities. Prayer can radically reorient daily life. So we are making prayer central again to reclaim our calling from Jesus to be a house of prayer. There it is. Hey, good morning. It's good to see you. Good to have you. And uh, happy post-Thanksgiving to all of you. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. 
I hope you could gather with your families, or if not, I just hope you had a great day just celebrating. Uh, We have so much to just be grateful for and thankful for, so uh, happy post-Thanksgiving, but you know know what that means. So Thanksgiving is over, Black Friday is now over. What season are we in now together? We are in Christmas season, so happy Christmas season to you. I'm excited just for the buildup, and uh, just as I was thinking about the season we're in, the new season that we're heading into building up to Christmas, who is the hardest person in your life to Christmas shop for? Just as you think about it, do you have somebody in mind when I ask that question, like who's the hardest person for you to shop for? For me, it's my dad. Uh, my dad is absolutely the hardest person to shop for, uh, for a variety of reasons, but the, the number one reason is there's nothing that he doesn't already have that I could give him. So it's like any tool, I mean, I could go to Harbor Freight today and walk through the most obscure aisle and pick the shelf and the thing that's like way in the back underneath, I could pull it out and I could go, here, dad, here's your tool. And he's going to look at me and go, I have three of these, but thank you. So I I don't like wasting money. I want to give a gift that he actually wants or desires. So years ago, I asked him and I was like, dad, I don't want to waste money on this. You know what, what do you want? Like, what can I give you that actually has value to you? And do you know what he said? He said this, I I don't know, how about some beef sticks? I was like, I can totally get behind some beef sticks. So this is what my dad gets from me every single Christmas. Um, Especially for you dads in the room that are carnivores, I mean, this is a win-win deal. Some of you are like, this is a genius idea. These are jalapeno cheddar, by the way, if you're wondering. I get them every year, and here's what's funny about these. They last forever. They last forever, like you pull them out and they're like still dripping in grease, you know what I mean? Oh, they're just fantastic. So this is what I get my dad every single year because I want to give him something that has value to him, uh, but but I want to give him something that maybe he doesn't yet already have. Uh, In this Christmas season, I mean, God started Christmas. I mean, it was the gift that he gave to us. He gave of himself. He gave of his son. And so that's why Christmas is such a giving season. My question for you, just as we're jumping off today and as we close out the prayer series today, is this, what can you give the God of all creation that already has everything? What, what, what can you give your heavenly father that he already doesn't have? What can you give the giver of life? As I was getting ready, uh, reading through Revelation, and Revelation actually sets the scene for the throne room of God with angels and different creatures and and elders that are gathered around the throne. And here's what it says in Revelation 5, 8. It says, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people people. Your prayers never go unnoticed. Your prayers never go unheard. I mean, it's just, it's so cool to me. I mean, just thinking like, here's the picture of the throne room of God. And one thing that he cherishes one thing that he treasures, one thing that he just loves, and he sets them aside, he puts them in golden bowls, are the prayers that you and I pray. The God of all creation loves to hear from us. Such a cool picture, such a cool thing. It's something, if I'm being honest, I, I often overlook it. Uh, it's like sometimes I think my prayers, if God's going to keep them like that, or if he's going to hold on or cherish, like, like they better be good prayers. You know what I mean? We're, we're teaching Judah how to pray. So Judah is my three-year-old. And uh, every night before bed is when we usually carve out the longest time to pray. And so for, for probably a year and a half or two years, just as we've worked with him, it's like usually I go first and then Shannon will go next. And then, then we say, okay, Judah, do you have anything that you want to pray for? And a lot of times he's like, nope, you know. And so we'll go, okay, just repeat after us. And so we'll say a couple of things and then he'll repeat and, and on and on. But it, just in the last couple of weeks, he's really started to take on ownership of praying himself. Like, it's so much fun as a dad seeing your son say, I want to pray. And so as, as he starts praying, he, it was funny, it was a week ago or two weeks ago, he starts praying, and it, it turns into this really long prayer. 
Where it's just, he's, got, and he's thanking God for his toys and his trucks and his macaroni and cheese and his chicken. I mean, it's like, he, it's so pure and it's so innocent. He's just, here's a three-year-old mind saying, Jesus, this is what I'm grateful for. This is what I'm thankful for. This is what I'm praying for. And so it's funny as he's praying, then he's still kind of forming his words though. So like, I'm picking up every Every two to three words, like, okay, I'm getting it. I'm understanding what he's praying for. But then at a certain point, like, this prayer is still going. And we're like, okay, I'm, are you actually praying now or are you stalling, right? Because he's three and he's smart. So he, he starts praying. And here, here's what I picked up on. I heard the same prayer, like, the second time and then the third time, and I was like, I think he's praying for the same thing over and over and over. And Shannon, my wife, caught on to it way faster than I did. She actually cut him off. She's like, okay, and we love you, Jesus, amen. You know, and he smiles and says amen, because we have things to do, Judah, and you have to go to bed. This is, it's just made me laugh, like thinking about prayer and whatnot, because oftentimes I think this is what we do. Our prayers, if we're not careful, can become super repetitive. Uh, they can become circular. It's like all of a sudden we, we just start praying the same thing over and over and over again, or we break off our prayer because we have things to do. We have places to be, we have jobs to go to, we have kids to put to bed. It's like often, often we feel forced to choose between, am I gonna spend some time in prayer and just be with God, or am I actually gonna go out and do something? I, I wanted to put this, this image up or like this spectrum. Often uh, our life we're forced to choose between doing and being. Being actually comes at the expense of doing. If you just want to be, if you just want to sit, it requires you to not do anything. And just if we're being honest, I mean, in our culture, our society, our world, whatever, our world not just celebrates doing but incentivizes doing, rewards doing, I mean, idolizes doing, like the, the movers and shakers of our world do. And prayer feels like it's on the exact opposite side of the spectrum. Prayer is an invitation from our Heavenly Father to just come and be. You know how hard that is for me? I mean, this, this prayer series has really unearthed a lot of struggle, I think, for me in my life or in how I relate to God or in how I pray because I, I, I'm finding myself, I'm constantly, and I think so many of us, this is true, I am constantly living in the camp of doing and sometimes or occasionally or vacationing for a day into the B category. But when you live in do, and when you live by your doing, when you become known by what you do, when your value is found in what you do, eventually you're going to run out. It turns dry. It turns arid. It turns empty. We get tired. And so to be actually is harder. I mean, I'll share more about this today. But to be, when, it, when we come back and when we sit and we go, okay, I just want to be right now. I just want to sit and do nothing. Oftentimes, we're suffering from the effects and the symptoms of being overdoers where we start feeling just tired. We don't have anything to offer. We, we don't know what, what else we can do, and so we just go to bed. Or, or worse, we just turn on a Netflix, or we turn on a movie, or we turn on what, and it's like we just coast or just check out into passivity. God has something better for us. He actually demonstrated it through his son, Jesus. The passage that we're talking about today, it's actually really, really short. But it's really significant. Here, here's what it says. <clears throat> this is Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. What's interesting about this, this passage is before, I mean, we're in Mark chapter 1. So there's only 34 verses of activity that precede this verse. 
But at the beginning, I mean, it talks about Jesus and it talks about how he started his ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist. He went and spent 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan himself, where he was praying, where he was fasting. Then, then he called his disciples. So he went place to place and he called out fishermen and he called out a doctor and he called out a tax collector. He called out different disciples, different young men to follow him, to learn from him, to, to become like him. So he's doing this and he's traveling. And then in the verses right before it says he was healing people. So people from all over the town, all over the region were bringing like their unhealthy, bringing the sick because Jesus would touch them or Jesus would pray for them and they would be healed. And then people were bringing the demon possessed and Jesus was casting out demons. I mean, the first 34 verses are packed with Jesus doing. And then we get this one small verse this one short sentence that says, very early, before everybody wakes up, before the lights are on in the house, before the sun comes up, Jesus wakes up and he sneaks out of the house and he goes to a place to be by himself to do what? Pray. He retreats and he gets away just to be. Why is that significant? Because doing for God was never meant to replace being with God. Jesus himself, I mean, I, as I sat with this, I'm like, why did Jesus have to pray? He's God. He has no sin to repent of. And, and yet, here he is over and over. I mean, this is fascinating. All throughout the Gospels, I never caught this before, how often Jesus left the masses, how often he left the disciples, how often it was like he would do ministry and do a work or do miracles or heal people, how often he would do things for God and with God. He, he would do the work of the ministry, and then he would retreat off by himself and pray. Jesus had a rhythm of prayer that was different than everyone else around him. He would do, and then he would swing back to the other side, and he would just be with his heavenly father. And then he would swing back, and he would do more ministry. He'd be working with his disciples. He'd be healing people or feeding people, teaching people. And then he would swing back, and he would just be with his heavenly father, even leading up to the cross. You see this regular, intentional rhythm, back and forth, doing and then being, doing and then being. Jesus was so intentional by the way he lived his life to demonstrate you are not human doers. You weren't created to just do things. I mean, think about this. The God of all creation can do anything he wants. He doesn't need us. Yet so often we find our value or we find our worth or we find our schedules dominating the doing part of our life at the expense of the being. So look what happened here. Mark chapter 1, verse 36. So the disciples wake up. I have an empathy for the disciples of Jesus like no one else. I just feel bad for these guys so often because it's like they were constantly losing Jesus or they were constantly not following, like not understanding what he was saying, or they overstepped, or it's like they had the different, the wrong thing in mind. Like I, I have a lot of empathy for the disciples of Jesus because I'm like, I probably would have been just like that, like constantly trying to figure this out and getting it wrong. But here's what happens. It says Simon in his companions went out to look for him because they wake up and Jesus is gone. I mean, can you imagine just the fear or the terror just for a second? Jesus comes and he says, hey, I want you to follow me. I'm going to teach you how to do and be like me. So they go, yes, sure. Awesome. This is great. We leave everything we follow. Jesus is doing amazing things. You're blown away and you wake up one morning and he's gone. So they're scrambling. They're panicky. They're looking around. They went out to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed. I love that. They exclaimed, right? Exuberantly. They're excited. They exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Why is everyone looking for Jesus? Because what Jesus can do, no one else can do. They were watching Jesus heal. They were watching him cast out demons. They were listening to the way he taught. 
Nobody could do like Jesus did. Jesus had so much value for what he could do for others that, that everyone was looking for him. The disciples did not have a rhythm like Jesus. They, they did not have a rhythm of doing and then being and then doing and then being or they would have understood what Jesus was doing and waited for him to get back. The disciples are so similar to us. I mean, what's funny, I talked about this Christmas season heading into like right now. We have a couple weeks now before Christmas. This season more than any other season of the year is dominated by our busyness. I mean, just as we get closer and closer to Christmas, I mean, in years past, uh, Shannon and I, we've been married for five years now, and then we dated, and I think we had a couple holidays before that. And, and every single year, I have family all the way out in Wisconsin and in Chicago. Shannon has family in Battle Creek and then here in Rockford. So we, what we have done every single year is we hit every single party. And we go place to 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 place. And I'm just going to be honest with you, I love it. It is so much fun for me until we had a child. And then it was miserable. Anybody else? It is miserable. All of a sudden, it's like you're lugging all of their stuff. You're lugging a crib. Then they're whiny. Then they need to be fed. I mean, it's like this isn't fun at all. And it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Our season that we're headed into right now, it's just going to get busier and busier and busier. Then we got school performances to go to. We have parties. We have deadlines and goals that we have to hit. Like this next season we're headed into is going to be the busiest of all of them. The disciples of Jesus were just like us. They had things to do. Why? Because their value was assigned to them based on what they could do. So let me ask you this. This is a trivial question, right? Rhetorical. But this, what makes a fisherman valuable? What makes him valuable? His ability to catch fish, right? Not a trick question, right? If you are a fisherman that does not catch fish, you are not a fisherman, you're a boater. Fair enough? So, so how about this? What about a doctor? What makes a doctor valuable? Their ability to help people. Their ability to, to make you better. To understand how your body works and, and, and pair medication and, and help heal you. Like a doctor's value is found in what they can do to help other people get better. What good is a doctor that kills everybody they work with? Not very valuable. How about this one? What makes a tax collector valuable? This one's super easy. The hint is in the name. What makes a tax collector valuable? They collect taxes. The better you are, the more you do, the more value you have. Our world functions like that. The more you do, the more valuable you are. Here's the most counterintuitive, countercultural thing that I could say to you straight out of the text today is this. What you do does not equal your value. It's who you are. And more importantly, it's who Jesus says you are. That's where your value comes from. The rhythm of prayer the rhythm of life, the rhythm of ministry that Jesus has, it's fluctuating back and forth between value ascribed to you, which is being, and then doing what God has called us and invited us to partner with him in doing. We swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, where most of us run into trouble when marriages start blowing up, when we start losing jobs, when finances go awry, when relationships begin breaking, when things like anxiety or depression get the worst, is when we camp on the do side of the pendulum and we neglect being altogether. Jesus established a rhythm of relating with God that moves from being to doing and then back to being. Here's the tension for me. If the Son of God 
prioritized prayer as a means of being with his heavenly father. Why do I feel like it's anything less than vital for my life? Luke 5, 16 says this. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If you read through all four of the Gospels, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four narratives of the life of Jesus, you will find these verses just like this one, very short, very obscure, all throughout. Jesus, Jesus would do things that capture my attention, right? Jesus would feed 5,000 people from, from like a lunchbox meal. And, and he feeds all these people or, or he's healing people in droves or he's casting out demons. Jesus would do these incredible things on behalf of his heavenly father. And I would miss the verse that followed right after and then Jesus withdrew. And, th and then he went away. And then he, he distanced himself from, from his disciples. Jesus' rhythm is so easy for us to miss because the, the things we love about Jesus is when he does stuff. The things that we love about our lives are when we do stuff. But the invitation for true life is to come be with our heavenly father. To have a rhythm of regularity in our relationship with him. Why? Because doing for God was never meant to replace being with God. John 15 says this, Jesus is talking, and he says, remain in me as, also, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So I, I have a tree on my, or in my yard. Uh, it's just a little pine tree. I planted it with a bunch of other ones this last spring. And uh, it started dying. So it started, it was weird. It started getting diseased, started at the top, and I could see like branches like turning brown. And then it was moving down and moving down and spreading. And so eventually, just after I did homework and talked to a couple different experts, they're like, it kind of just seems like the tree is diseased. But like it was still alive. Like it was still functioning. I mean, it still had green needles, but like a lot of the needles looked like this. So I, I cut it down like three or four weeks ago. Uh, and I kept it, because that's weird. I, I kept the tree and I threw it behind uh, like a shed. And so last night, like I, as I was driving home, I'm like, I still have that tree. I wonder what that looks like. So I went out this morning and uh, this is the branch that I clipped from it. And this is this is it, so, right? So I, I read John 15. Remain in me as I also remain in you. The word remain means abide. It means rest, stop, just be. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. As soon as we become untapped, unconnected, disconnected, fill in the blank, as soon as we, as soon as we get independent and we camp out, we pinch a tent in the do category of our life, this is what happens. All of a sudden, I mean, it's really funny. It, we get brittle. We get dry. Um, we get anxious. I mean, there's no more fruit. There's no more life. I mean, like, it, it's crazy too. Like the substance of the, it's, it's light. It's airy. Do you know what happens to a tree that dies in the woods? Eventually it just falls over. This breaks in half. I was out hunting yesterday. I had to crawl through one of them. It fell right across the path, and every, every part of it is just dead. Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you only just do, this is the outcome. You, you won't have anything of value for anybody else. You'll be brittle. You'll be weak. You'll be falling apart. And you know, it's funny, like when the storm comes, storms can be detrimental to branches that are no longer attached to the vine. But then here's what he says right after. He says this, I am the vine. You are the branches. 
If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is another pine tree on our yard uh, that I clipped a branch of this morning. Notice the difference? I mean, it's even, it's moving. It's wiggling. It's weird. It's green. It's flexible. I mean, it's full of life. It's healthy. I mean, as you compare the two, one is dead and one is alive. And Jesus is saying, this is what I have to offer you. Because the storm rolls in and this thing gets really flexible. It, It bears fruit. It maintains its shape. In fact, it continues to grow. And it gets bigger. And it gets stronger. And it continues to get healthier. Jesus is saying, when you are attached to me as the vine, this will be the outcome of your life. So if our value is found in our doing, this is what we will end up with. But if our value if our rhythm can be established in our being and only our doing comes out of our being, Jesus is saying, you can't do anything without me, but with me, what you do will actually bear fruit. It'll last. It'll make a difference. It'll it'll make a difference in your life, in your family's life, in, in your workplace, in your school, in your marriage. When you're established and rooted and grounded in me, it actually changes everything. So this past week, um, I've been tired. I, I've actually felt like in the last couple weeks or months, like I felt like I've been in one of these seasons. I find myself getting more irritable, more frustrated, more angry, more stressed, more short with people. I mean, it's, I, I find myself like this. I'm getting more and more and more frustrated and seemingly more and more and more brittle. So all all throughout this last week, I've been looking for different opportunities just just to be. I'm out hunting in the woods. I mean, I had had my phone. It's just crazy how distracting this is and how much it prevents us from just being. So I I turned on do not disturb mode. I put it in my pocket and I went, "What, what does it feel like if I just be? It was so hard. My eye was twitching. I was so tired. I'm like, God's going, you're you're doing life without me. Come back to the source. Last night I turned on, it was like a Hillsong, the band, the artist. I turned on a Hillsong concert. So Saturday nights before preaching, it's like I just, I come in here and I pray. I worship, I sing, uh, I do final prep, slides, whatever. Last night I came in and I went, I just need to be, I just need to sit. And my prayer was this, God, would you just minister to me? So I turned on this concert, I played it for an hour. And I just sat, I sat right over here in the front for an hour and just let it minister to me. And it did. The invite that I have for you today is to do the exact same thing. We changed our worship set today so that actually the back half is where a lot of the music is. So in this next song, especially, if you just need to sit, just sit. We have this prayer room over here that's been set up now for the last three and a half weeks. If you haven't personally yet had the opportunity to go utilize it, do it. Sit and just rest. Just be, just spend time with your heavenly father. Reconnect to the vine. And and I wanna ask you, imagine what it could look like, how different your life could be if you say, this is what I'm going to do this season. I'm not gonna get pulled into the busyness. I'm not gonna get pulled into the stress. I'm not gonna get pulled into the doing. I'm just going to sit and be. The word Emmanuel has come up multiple times this morning. It just means God with us. God of all creation didn't just do for us, but he wants to be with us. So that's what we're gonna do. So let me pray for us and then whatever you need to do, go for it. God, we just come before you right now. A lot of us tired. 
A lot of us are stressed. A lot of us feel distant. A lot of us feel brittle right now. A lot of us feel empty. A lot of us are looking ahead even to what this next month holds. And we're also keeping an eye on COVID. And there's a lot of people who are either being affected or have friends or family who are close to them that are being affected right now. We just lay that at your feet, God. I just pray that even in this space that we've carved out today, we, we just pray um, that you would invite us to step into your presence that we would find what we need, but that we would find what we're looking for in you. That it wouldn't be about doing. It wouldn't be about what we can do for you or what we have done for you or about what you can or have done for us, but that it would just be about being with you. God, minister to us right now. Thank you for your son, Jesus. pray this in his name. Amen. Grandeur is great. that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken no matter where you've gone through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Still no 
travel through life, I think a lot of us tend to um, pick up things along the way. We pick up crowns, and what a crown is essentially is um, anything that says, Jesus, I can do this in my own strength. And so that might look like self-sufficiency, that might look like perfectionism, X, Y, Z, you fill in the box, whatever it is. Each of us have a crown that needs to be surrendered to the Lord this morning. It just comes with our humility. So take some inventory in this time as we just rest in the Lord. Ask him what that crown is. Jesus, I want to be more dependent on you. What is it that I need to lay down before you this morning? And as we respond, just sing holy, holy, holy. Because that's who he is. He's due all our praise. Sing this. So first service, something funny or something interesting happened. Uh, the middle screen behind me, actually, the words got stuck. They got frozen on the first song that we sang after the message, which is, it is well. 
And so the, the lyrics that were stuck up there was, it is well, it is well with my soul. And uh, just as I was sitting and worshiping even first service, I felt like what God was saying is, some of you in here, your soul is not well. It's not. That maybe it's dry, maybe it's prickly, maybe it's hurting, anxious, worried, whatever it is. Um, don't leave in the same condition as you came in if that's you. you know, what God offers us is this. It's vibrant, it's healthy, it's full of life and nourishment and nutrients. And his invitation is come, come to me. Come to me. So just as we close, um, I have a benediction for you, which means blessing. But if you're in that place where you're like, you know what, I just, I, I need somebody just to pray with me at the close of today. This is closing out our prayer series. So if, you, if you're like, you know what, today I, I want to do something. I want to take a next step. I want to come forward. Uh, I'll be up here. We'll have our team up here. The worship band behind me will stay up here. So uh, if that's you, don't miss the invitation. But uh, for the rest of us, I just want to close with a benediction, which just means blessing. Uh, so if you want to extend your hands just as a posture of reception, just to receive this as we leave today. Brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, God desires closeness with you. You are agents of change, ambassadors of Him that can usher in the kingdom of God in every corner of the world. But the ability to do that can only come from a place and a rhythm of being with your heavenly Father. As you leave today, don't miss the subtle, quiet invitation from Him to come and just be. Because doing for God was never meant to replace being with Him. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. We love you guys and are excited to have you back next week as we kick off our new Christmas series. See you then.